You are listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Evan Becks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's November 20th. The U.S. passed 250,000 COVID-19 deaths this week. And with cases and hospitalizations continuing to rise in most parts of the country, many health systems are facing the need to increase critical care capacity. But perhaps even more concerning is the fact that some health systems need guidance about how to allocate scarce but life-saving resources. These include ventilators for patients and personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. In many settings, decisions about using these resources are being made ad hoc, with limited information and no input from patients and families. At the start of the pandemic, RAND researchers created a rapid response checklist to help healthcare decision makers and state policymakers navigate these harrowing decisions. With the COVID-19 crisis getting worse and worse in the U.S., the checklist may be more valuable than ever. The checklist was developed with input from clinicians, health system leaders, and bioethicists, as well as patients, family members, and members of communities that have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. You can view the complete checklist at RAND.org. The continued spread of COVID-19 has also kept most U.S. schools closed to in-person instruction. Up until now, little information has been gathered directly from educators about what's happening on the ground. A new RAND survey has filled this gap. Unfortunately, the findings paint a dire picture of how the pandemic is affecting students and teachers. Here are some of the key takeaways. Only 20% of principals reported that most of their students were receiving fully in-person instruction. 33% reported fully remote instruction, and 47% reported using a hybrid model. The highest poverty schools and schools that serve high percentages of minority students are less likely to offer in-person instruction. And access to devices and the internet continues to be a disproportionate challenge for students in high-poverty schools. Teachers report that students are less prepared to participate in grade-level work, but only 10% of principals said that their school was providing more students with tutoring or supplemental courses that might help kids catch up. Teachers are also having difficulties contacting their students and holding them accountable. On average, teachers said that they were able to contact only four out of every five of their students, and many teachers have stopped assigning letter grades. And finally, teacher morale is low. About 80% of teachers report feeling burnout, and one quarter said that they were likely to leave the teaching profession altogether. These findings highlight the urgent need to focus on making schools safer to attend in person, One way to do this is to collect as much data as possible on the safety precautions that many schools already have in place. With an understanding of which precautions are effective, federal and state governments may be in a better position to set clear safety guidelines and supports for a return to in-person instruction. At the start of the pandemic, millions of Americans made the transition to working from home. This flexibility comes with benefits, including protection from both COVID-19 and job loss. But these benefits have flowed primarily to white and more educated workers. Of the millions of essential workers in the U.S. who can't work from home, the vast majority are in low-wage jobs. Cashiers, food service workers, delivery drivers. These essential workers tend to be younger and are more racially and ethnically diverse. The unequal access to teleworking could make existing inequality trends even worse. But there are ways to offset some of the disparities, say RAND researchers. For example, underutilized office buildings might be adapted into affordable housing for essential workers. And expanding broadband access could enhance telework opportunities in rural areas, while also providing access to online education and telehealth services. 
teleworking will surely continue beyond the pandemic. These potential solutions could help ensure that people who can't work from home still reap some of the benefits of this societal shift. Enrollment at America's community colleges is down by nearly 10% compared with before the pandemic. The decline is even steeper among people who are enrolling for the first time. According to RAND experts, this is a bad sign, not just for community college students, who represent more than a third of all U.S. college students, but also for the community college system, the nation's workforce, and the economy overall. Community and technical colleges are important. For first-generation college students, particularly students of color and those from low-income families, community college can be a path to a four-year degree or a middle-skill career, such as an electrician, dental hygienist, or a paralegal. In fact, community colleges provide most of the training for middle-skill jobs in the U.S. With enrollment down, community colleges need financial support to stay afloat. Without short-term funding and long-term investment, these schools may not be able to infuse the labor force with critical talent during what's sure to be a difficult economic recovery. President Trump has ordered the Pentagon to reduce the number of U.S. troops in Afghanistan and elsewhere by mid-January, just before the end of his presidency. Granted, winning in Afghanistan may not be an available option, but according to a 2019 RAND paper, a hasty withdrawal, no matter how rationalized, would mean, quote, choosing to lose. Potential consequences of a precipitous troop drawdown in Afghanistan include a loss of influence and legitimacy for the Kabul government, increased control for the Taliban, a widening of the Afghan civil war, and opportunities for extremist groups to make inroads. The authors of the paper also conclude that pulling out of Afghanistan could be a blow to American credibility. And there's a distinct possibility that U.S. troops would have to return there down the road, potentially under worse conditions. North Korea has a reputation for engaging in bad behavior after U.S. presidential elections. That's why experts fear that Kim Jong-un may be planning to commit provocative actions sometime between now and January 20th, when President-elect Joe Biden will take the oath of office. In particular, Kim may try to gain the attention of new U.S. leaders to demonstrate his ability to influence them. He's likely also anxious to test North Korea's evolving military capabilities. Fortunately, Rand's Bruce Bennett says that there are ways Biden can deter Kim's actions. Biden should consider moving beyond the Trump administration's so-called maximum pressure campaign, and instead adopt a carrot-and-stick strategy for managing Pyongyang, Bennett says. On the carrot side, for example, Biden could promise that when he is inaugurated, he will provide North Korea with medical supplies, such as COVID-19 treatments and vaccines, as long as there have been no North Korean provocations for six months. There are also many sticks that Biden could wield, including announcing plans to carry out active information operations against the North Korean regime, that is, until it agrees to a freeze on its nuclear weapon production, with adequate verification. By using enough of these carrots and sticks, President-elect Biden could demonstrate to Kim that his administration won't be a pushover and will impose serious penalties for future provocation. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. For more on what we covered this week, check the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We're off next week for Thanksgiving, but we'll be back with a new episode on December 4th. We hope you have a safe and happy holiday.